This past Rosh Hashanah, uh, the New York Times ran a feature article on the American bar mitzvah and the state of the American bar mitzvah. Those interviewed for the articles, communal leaders, rabbis, parents, all expressed an anxiety that the bar mitzvah, as it stood, was marking the end of a Jewish student's engagement as opposed to the beginning of his or her responsibility as a Jewish adult. The article talked about congregations that have now gamely pledged to reinvent the bar mitzvah ceremony. And as I did more research into this, I found that there was a website called the Ne Mitzvah Revolution. And this website talks about different ways that congregations can engage their students in a revolution. A lot of what these articles and websites had to talk about was moving away from an excess uh, materialism that could be found in a recent YouTube video of a <laughs> bar mitzvah boy flanked by Las Vegas style dancers. And if you go to YouTube and you look under bar mitzvah, you find other examples of these types of parties, preteens and limousines cruising around. Of course, of course, throughout the country there are b'nai mitzvah students having wonderful, meaningful uh, ceremonies. But I think this general idea of taking time to reanalyze something that's so central to American Jewish life is a good idea. But one thing I suggest, and I haven't heard that much about, is thinking about curriculum. So the current b'nai mitzvah curriculum consists of a student learning uh, liturgy, leading a liturgy service, leading a Torah service, half Torah service, um, and giving a speech, and doing a communal service project. All of these things are wonderful, and I don't think that they should be supplanted or replaced. What I do think, though, is that taking the lens of American Jewish history, and specifically a focus on the turn of the century bar mitzvah, could give all of these components added meaning and allow them to see uh, the whole ceremony and education in new light. So what I propose is a new curriculum focusing on American Jewish history. To me, the beginning of American Jewish history, the real beginning of American Jewish history, uh, started at the, towards the end of the 19th century when you have the arrival of East European Jews, over two million fleeing Eastern Europe and coming to America to escape religious persecution and to seek economic opportunity. The East European Jews settled in the cities of the Northeast and the Midwest, and within those cities formed enclaves. Um, the most famous of these is, of course, the Lower East Side of New York. By 1910, it was the largest Jewish city in the world, and it was also the most crowded neighborhood in the country, some people argued in the world. When you look at this picture, you get a sense of the bustling life that was part of this time period. Um, this is Orchard Street, just south of Hester. The year is 1898. You can see people shopping. You can see people rushing. You can see people selling. You can also see the garment industry. I also wanted to note, too, the Yiddish signs. The, the language of the day was Yiddish. However, it was a Yiddish that by the hour was changing and incorporating new English words and English phrases because, of course, the young generation was going to public school and learning English. So Yiddish and English were merging together in ways that aren't uh, dissimilar from what's happening uh, with Spanish and English in some of our cities today. So the most important person in this picture for us, for our topic tonight, is the boy that's in the lower right-hand corner. It's hard to see him because he's actually carrying a whole stack of fabric, a bundle of, of garments that he's taking from one shop to another. We can guess that this boy is about 12 or 13 years old. This was the age when many immigrant children left school. Jews, more than any other immigrant group of the time, relied on the wages, wages of their elder children. And so this boy, unlike bar mitzvah boys today, who are juggling soccer and Hebrew school. <laughs> this boy is juggling Hebrew school with maybe night school and also work. So it's a slightly different situation. And he's carrying those garments into shops that were all over this neighborhood. Here's a photo of a Jacob Rees photo, a famous photojournalist who took a picture towards the end of the 19th century of a garment shop on Ludlow Street on the Lower East Side. The garments that were being assembled here would be picked up by that boy, who was also called the schlepper, who would bring it back to the contractor. And from the contractor, it would move on to department stores throughout the country. So these Jews were literally clothing the nation. And they were also stitching together new lives for themselves. Here is a picture of Harris and Jenny Levine's home. It's a recreated home at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum. Harris and Jenny Levine came to New York from Plantz, Poland in 1890. By 1892, they were living at 97 Orchard. Harris ran a dressmaking shop. 
So that schlepper might be bringing clothes to Harris. He hired three workers, and he, with those workers, would put those dresses together, usually six days a week, 14 hours a day. In that same space, a 340-square-foot apartment, he and his wife, Jenny, were also raising five children. They sent their children to public schools because for the immigrant generation, for the tenement dwellers, the public school was the way that their kids could get out of the tenement districts. They could live the American dream if they had this wonderful education. The downside of that, though, was how are they going to train their sons, Herman and Max, to have their own bar mitzvahs? Uh, if they're spending time in the public schools, how are they going to learn to have a religious education? But what they did, we know they did. This is a picture on your left of Pauline and Max Levine in 1910. Max is 13, this is his bar mitzvah picture. The other picture is a boy named Max Marcus who also grew up on Orchard Street. We know a little bit more about his story from his grandchildren. Apparently he was a little bit of a wild kid skipping school, but somehow, somehow his parents who also had seven other children got him to be trained for a bar mitzvah, and he, there he is with his talis, and his family remembers him as a bar mitzvah boy. We don't know that much about these bar mitzvah ceremonies because obviously we don't have YouTube videos of them. But we know from oral histories that they tended to be rather simple affairs. The boy would go to the synagogue, he would recite a portion of the Torah, the Haftorah, he would give a speech, and there'd be a small reception at the synagogue. So this is very different from today where bar mitzvah receptions transform hotel ballrooms Back then, they transformed maybe the synagogue basement, or they transformed sometimes tenement apartments. There were some families that didn't even have the funds to have the reception in the synagogue, so invited people back to their tenement apartments. And one oral history I read talked about um, a woman who was so grateful when her brother had his bar mitzvah ceremony, the neighbors opened up their tenement apartment so that they could flow from, from one room to the next on one floor and celebrate that way. Another way we can learn about what was discussed and what was talked about and what was thought about maybe at these bar mitzvah ceremonies is through books of published speeches that started to go out in the early uh, 20th century. This one is called uh, Bar Mitzvah Redis, Bar Mitzvah Speeches. And you can see the price of this book was 35 cents. It contained 40 bar mitzvah speeches, both for the bar mitzvah and also for his father as well. So if they needed a speech, they could pay 35 cents to a push cart <laughs> vendor and have 40 to choose from. And they could flip through it and pick which one best met the sentiments of their hearts or just the one that was easiest to memorize. And there, they had a speech. Um, but the speeches tell us a lot about what these people were thinking about, or at least what they thought was OK to talk about at a bar mitzvah ceremony, even if they themselves did not write it. There's gratitude expressed for being in America. There's thankfulness at, at having left Russia, where they talk about the atrocities, uh, where they discuss the pogroms of Kishinev and Odessa. Uh, in America, you don't have the violence. In America, brothers, sisters, and parents are protected under the, American, the wings of the American eagle, where all can enjoy equal rights. So there's a lot of praise for America and the opportunity that America offers. Um, but these bar mitzvah speeches also note complexities in the adaptation of immigrant life to America, of Jewish life to America. Um, they note that some people are skeptical about the future of American Jewish life. One bar mitzvah speech addresses this head on, and he says, among those assembled here, I know that there are those who are not happy about life in America. They feel that we spend more time in public school than in the cheder, that we devote more time to geography and the grammar of the English language than we do to Pentateuch and to Rashi. But the speech rebounds and says, you know what? You don't have to worry so much. Sometimes if we learn the secular subjects, these secular subjects will in turn help us understand the Bible better. Um, if we learn about grammar, we're better able to learn Hebrew grammar. If we learn geography, we'll understand the geography of the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that every uh, bar mitzvah really you know, took all his secular learning and became Jewish scholars. But what I am saying is that in this generation, in a time of severe economic need, families uh, and communities came together to discuss what was on everyone's mind, to discuss whether Judaism could survive in America. Another speech that I like kind of uh, is reminiscent of some of the debates today, where one bar mitzvah boy says, you know, I know there are some boys for whom the bar mitzvah marks the termination of his studies. I am not like those boys. God forbid <laughs> I should be one of those boys. 
but how is this instructive and how can we wrap this into curriculum for students today? Well, I think it's important because I think it's important for uh, a Jewish community that has much more uh, wealth that has much more time, that has much more talents, who have successfully learned so much of secular knowledge, to think of ways that they can apply that to uh, Jewish life and Jewish education. Um, their immigrant forebears had so little, and we have so much. And how can we take what we learn and make creative ceremonies? How can we even take the creativity that that boy put into that dance and ha unleash that on the ceremony in new ways? The bar mitzvah speeches themselves might become models for today's B'nai Mitzvah students to think about a speech that instead of talking about how leprosy relates to the gossip at their school, uh, to think about how the speech could be a time that they think about how to be American and how to be Jews, how they could interview people in their community or their grandparents to talk about what were the struggles you had as an American and a Jew, and, and how might this 13-year-old now think about the American Jew he or she wants to become. Another way I think this can be helpful is I think it can help us reframe some of the community service projects, which I think in general are great. Today, community service projects often deal with helping the homeless or helping the environment or dealing, you know, working at animal shelters. These are all great things. But if we take the lessons of turn of the century bar mitzvah and we think of the economic and social context of our great great grandparents, I think there's a lot to be done with immigrant communities today. The, largest, the cities with the largest Jewish populations also happen to be the cities with the largest immigrant populations. Why not have our congregations and our communities think of ways that we can bring together B'nai Mitzvah students with immigrant communities, many of whom are dealing with the same issues our great-great-grandparents dealt with? Because that speech, after all, talked about the American Eagle and everyone should be safe and be able to have equal rights under those wings. How can we as American Jews ensure that immigrants have that safety and have that protection. All of this is daunting, and all of this will take a lot of work, but I take inspiration from the place that I work. The Lower East Side Tenement Museum every year welcomes over 200,000 people of diverse backgrounds to learn about immigrant history. We teach the past so we can better understand the present, and I think this model can work if we bring it to Jewish curriculum. I want to end on a personal note. As I started preparing this speech, I went through my photo album in search of a bat mitzvah picture, of my own bat mitzvah picture. Um, this Sabbath will actually be the anniversary of my bat mitzvah, the 10th anniversary, just kidding, the 28th. <laughs> and um, as I was looking for my bat mitzvah picture, I actually found this, and it marks the beginning of my Jewish education. Um, the teacher here is a, a Hebrew teacher named Inez Sheinfeld, who worked at Temple Emmanuel B'nai Jeshurun. And every uh, Sunday, and then during the week as well, she taught Hebrew school. She went from classroom to classroom with a pointer, and she taught the Aleph Bet to students, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds. She taught Hebrew, too. As they got older, they could learn more than the alphabet, but they could learn words. She was very strict, but I think she loved all of her students. And I think she loved me and my sister most of all, because we were her granddaughters. Um, and she would always call on us. <laughs> but when I look at this picture and I see uh, the Hebrew letters, I also see generations coming together to learn. And I see family. And I think if we really want to revolutionize the bar mitzvah ceremony, and we want to revolutionize uh, our Jewish communities and learning, this is a multi-generational effort. Um, and I think that we can do it. Thanks for watching Eli Talks. Click through or subscribe to the Eli Talks channel for more inspired Jewish ideas.